Meet the creators of the comic Kamikaze, Carrie and Alan Tupper and Havana Nguyen. Their creation started as a webcomic and grew from several print versions to an animated short with the help of a dedicated fan base and several crowdfunding campaigns. Welcome to Scratch Claw Push, a podcast about artists clawing out a place for themselves in the world. I'm Billy Joe Cones. And I'm Brandon Duke. Let's go. So welcome to the show, the uh, creators of the Kamikaze comic. So we got uh, great to be here. We have uh, Carrie Tupper, and her husband Hello. Alan, and we have Havana Noyen mm-hmm. here, joining in on the fun. So uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having thanks. us. I've, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I have followed you guys as probably I want to say probably since somehow I I caught on to your your first Kickstarter. Back in the day. Oh, yeah. that's how so you like, know us. Okay. That yeah. Is- I, well, I used to, I Ooh. think, um, yeah, I used to know one of your associates, uh, Michael H. Harper. Yeah. Michael. Oh, yes. okay. Great. Yeah, I, I awesome. worked with him on a short film back in the day and my brother also did another short film with him. So that's like, I think I probably caught on to you guys through him. Way, Wait, way is back. that the baseball right. one? Yeah. My brother was actually uh, an executive producer on the, the baseball what? short. Yeah, uh, th- that is literally how I met Michael Harper. I was a, so I was funny. a set photographer for him. Oh wow! Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> my, my brother had some interesting stories about that. That was <laughs> wild. It, it's a it's a it's an excellent short film too. It's very very well made. So, so we'll uh, we can put a link for that in cool. the show notes if anybody wants to know. Like this, like this is the genesis of how we all you know found each other. <laughs> very cool. That's awesome. I did not know. All that. right. <laughs> So at the outset, this has become a a, a, uh, a a trademark of the show. We're going to call it the uh, the sixty second resume or the sixty second introduction. We are going to go around between the three of you, and uh, Alan has already agreed to graciously go first. Yeah, go, he's going to go. Uh, yeah, first man in. Or all right, he's going to he's going to take that flag for the rest of us. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. he's, so we're going to give you sixty seconds. Bridge. And you're going to introduce yourself. Think of it like, again, like your verbal resume to the audience. Yeah. Billy, do yeah. you have the, uh, the clock ready? The clock is ready. And okay. go. Hey there. I'm uh, Alan Tupper. I am the uh, one of the co-creators of the, the Kamikaze comic and animation series. Uh, originally from Maine. Uh, technically the CEO of this little merry troupe. Uh, we got a little media company called Moving Inc. Media that we... Uh, do the comic through and a couple of other projects and uh, been in the animation comics and game dev space since 2007 and uh, they haven't kicked me out yet uh, uh, have a wide range of, of interests and stuff including uh, renewable energy don't get me started on using magnesium as a uh, fuel because I will talk too much about that uh, and uh, but no just a sort of a standard run of the mill uh, sci-fi nerd from uh, the coast of Maine who found his way down to Atlanta uh, and met a, a lovely woman uh, who was also interested in making weird and wild comics with me. Wow. And One second remaining. Oh, Good job. man. Look at that. This is confirming right. my hypothesis that humans just know what a minute is. So mm. <laughs> who so. wants to go next, Carrie or Havana? Uh, I'm happy to go next. Um, okay. Yeah. And All right. Restart the clock. Here we go. I'm Havana Wynn. Uh, I'm the lead character artist on Kamikaze. I've been working on this uh, since I graduated from college back in 2011, 2012. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, I first started off as the um, character artist, uh, just helping out with the pitch document for the uh, for Kamikaze. Started off as an animated series pitch. And I just like grew to love working with Alan and Carrie. And I just love the world and the characters of Kamikaze so much that I stuck around. And then um, now I'm helping with the artwork for uh, the comic pages. We just released book three, which we are very uh, excited about. Um, outside of that, I am in, I actually work full time in tech. I uh, work as a, a user experience design lead um, in e-commerce. Uh, and uh, one of my favorite things to talk about with other readers and other aspiring comic artists is how to make a comic while working a part-time job <laughs> or a full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. So just Thank a little you. over the wire on that one. Just a little. <laughs> All right. And right. Carrie, last, last but not little. least, are you ready? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, I guess. Go. <laughs> My name is Carrie Tupper. I am the co-creator, uh, writer, and um, ink and paint artist for Kamikaze. I am also the one of the executive producers, uh, co-directors, voice directors, voice casters, and our uh, voice caster, and did a lot of other stuff on um, the animated short. Uh, I am pretty much doing kamikaze full-time and everything that is herein i mean alan and havana did a great job sort of summing it up but mostly um i i just try to keep uh keep the quality of the content up and make sure that we're we're doing a good job and doing a good job by our readers great she was also the casting director and cast a voice cast uh, director on uh, the short. <laughs> I, guys, I can't sell myself. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is a legitimate struggle I have forever. <laughs> we have her out. That, that's okay. Um, can I ask, I want to ask Carrie one question before we move on since she, you know, technically had like 12 seconds left. Um, so before you were full time doing this, what were you doing before that? I was in a depressive state and it sucked. Sorry, I got real quick. I shouldn't laugh at that. But <laughs> so just... real, real quick. I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, basically, Kamikaze came out, uh, like Alan and I were working on, uh, like there's a, a little story I like to tell with, uh, with Kamikaze, um, where Alan and I were working in school on a project called basically the, 24 hour sketch dump or something like that, where you had to fill up a page of a hundred sketchbook pages in 24 hours. And Alan threw out this uh, sketch of what became Marcasia in her suit. And I was like, that, that chica has a story. I want to do something with her. And so we just started throwing ideas back and forth and it became um, what it is today. Uh, but part of the reason I had, um, <laughs> I had a, uh, like it got started was because uh, the crash of 08 happened. I was really struggling to find any work. Um, and like, I had always wanted to work in animation, but then as I got work in animation, I was finding myself burnt out and exhausted. And like, I just wasn't thriving in the way that I expected to. So I started kind of going into this really, really awful downward spiral. And then Alan, one Christmas, he handed me like for my Christmas present was a folder that said kamikaze project bible and said let's work on this together and and let's make it and so one of the reasons that i am still here today is because alan made sure that i am and that you uh that working on kamikaze like like everybody's like oh my gosh this this project actually saved my life blah blah, blah. no no for sure it actually did so <laughs> that is the actual story but Best twenty dollars ever spent at Staples. <laughs> <laughs> no, Carrie, I love that. I love that story because I feel like you know, with the with the three years, last three years that all of us have had, what I heard from a lot of my friends who are actors during that time was that they they kind of lost any sense of meaning or purpose because they didn't yep. have anything to do, and the people that mm -hmm. I think got through it were the ones that gave themselves a purpose basically and didn't wait for someone yeah. else oh, to yeah. give them a I purpose anymore that. i know yeah. kamikaze got us through the past three years for sure so for sure yeah. like yeah. i think there's a lot to be said for giving like it's, it's a weird thing like especially within hollywood and entertainment like there's this aspect of like okay i have to have this permission to tell mm -hmm. my own story I have to have, like, somebody has to give me permission to do the thing. I have to have somebody to give me permission to have the money, all that sort of stuff. And this mm -hmm. is not to say that money isn't necessary for filmmaking or creative works, because it absolutely <laughs> is. Um, but Preach at the it same to the time. Choir on that one. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, but, you know, never, uh, never underestimate the power of somebody's willpower and, you know, that sort of... Um, internal oh what is it it's a word that's basically like almost delusional but not of just mm. i'm gonna do it and no one's gonna stop me 
So uh, the sort we of we all need a little bit of that. Wildly <laughs> aspirational. How about there that? There you yes. go. That's a yeah. great way to put it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Never underestimate the power of uh, stubbornness and of uh, subscription to Adobe Photoshop. And there you, go. <laughs> you can get a lot of done with this. <laughs> no, Carrie, that's great because uh, uh, I just actually, the, I don't know if this is the word, but I read an article on Medium that was about the power of delusional optimism. There it is. Optimism. That's a great mm-hmm. word for it. Yep. And yeah, I, I think all creative ventures and even like entrepreneurial ventures need a little bit of that delusional <laughs> like optimism. <laughs> Uh, just because, I mean, you know, the lots of things were stacked against us from the very beginning, right? Um, I mean, Alan uh, did work in animation, but, um, you know, Carrie and I had very limited exposure to it. Uh, we don't have a show under our belt already. We've never worked in comics. Uh, so, I mean, on paper, if anyone, if we were to pitch to anyone that, oh, I'm going to uh, start this comic, Kamikaze, Kamikaze, and this like grand epic adventure, uh, people would have probably like, uh, are you sure? <laughs> it's what I think it, somebody told me at one point, it was like the pure gay audacity and to, to get things done. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it is kind of that. It's just like that, that like sort of optimistic audacity to just say, mm-hmm. I'm going to do it, I guess. And then that yeah. delusional os- optimism. That goes with or, it. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes it's like you just succeed because you don't know you're supposed to fail. Right. There yeah. is that. Like, mm-hmm. yep. Um, I That's think definitely when we started doing the comic, that was definitely the case because we had, we developed out this, the, the series concept. Um, we'd done a pitch Bible. We'd done a pilot script. We'd done all of the character designs. So we had a lot of like the, the baseline stuff for it, like a TV pitch. And we, we basically came to the conclusion that we were early on that pitch. And we just like, well, you know what? We really want to tell a story. We don't want to have to wait around for permission. Um, how hard could a web comic be? Oof. That, <laughs> uh, that, that was uh, the question we did not need answered at that moment because it really allowed us to, to get to the first 25 pages. It's like, oh, that was a lot of work. I guess we're committed now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, like, it's really impressive to me because like you guys, I remember it, like the first, I don't want to correct me if I'm wrong. Was it the first actual print version that was that the first Kickstarter or was it, or was there? Yeah. One? Yep. Yeah. Cause that, I mean, that's what I remember. I'm thinking like, and you guys did like a few of those, which is really impressive to me because yeah, I would say to anyone, if you really want to know who your friends are, launch a, launch a Kickstarter, launch a crowdfunding <laughs> campaign. Cause you will clear out the room really fast right? when, when you right. start you know, coming with your hands out. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. So yeah, tell and, us like and, what when so yeah, when, what, at what point were you like you you done the web comic you says okay I want we want to take this to the next level. Walk us through that process or what makes gets you ready to take that that next leap. Uh, Havana, you want to say this? Yeah, or do you want me to do I it? mean, like from the very start of beginning the web comic, we liked the web comic rep because it was a way for us to just freely publish the story, the characters, and just see if anyone is even interested. Um, and there was some com- uh, conversation in the beginning, like, do we want to charge for it? Do we want to put up a paywall after X number of pages? Do we, like, how, what do we want to do with this? We decided to make it free and accessible uh just because we want the story out there we wanted as much engagement and awareness but then all like a few years in people kept asking us if a print comic was ever going to come out even though it was free on you know uh our website and i think you know uh, i love print comics i love having the tactile comic in my hands so i totally get it but that was a really big surprise to us like not only were we establishing some return readers and a pretty like good reader base for the webcomic itself? Like people were actually asking to pay for a physical product. Um, so that was already like so validating. Um, then getting the Kickstarter going, uh, we were really nervous at first. Kickstarters are a lot of work as you probably know, Brandon, <laughs> um, but like, I think it just kind of fell into place, um, you know, all the things that happened. I mean, I always recommend to people like for Kickstarters and stuff, 
Um, it is nice to have like some sort of like initial following at first. Um, Cause the other thing about Kickstarters on top of the actual funds is like, it's great for marketing the property as well. Um, so that that's one of the biggest um, advantages of that, but there's a lot of work. People, people don't just yeah. send out the link and then you just collect money. <laughs> No, there are whole companies devoted to getting mm -hmm. the lead up to the Kickstarter and producing the Kickstarter campaign itself. So that's a yeah. whole production you can pay someone to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, and then like is. when we got the first print book, it, oh, we felt so like legit. We were so proud of it. In fact, there was a time and period where for a while, whenever I went to baby showers and stuff, I would bring my own baby and it would be Kamikaze Volume 1. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, I, that, that, I mean, no, it's it's very impressive like that because, I mean, the, the one I did failed spectacularly. So, uh, mm. and, and even then, like that was, even in a failed campaign, like that was literally like we were, me and my uh, my partner, Clayton, who uh, I know mm -hmm. Alan and Carrie and Billy all know, um, mm -hmm. like we we had stuff to drop like every day on social oh. media for 30 days and still and i was just yeah. thinking man and that like because i mean really just getting the goal is like the starting point it seems like oh, then yeah. now you got to go out and produce the thing and mm -hmm. then go like distribute all the packages all the things and i'm like that the logistical side of that is is not to be taken lightly yeah, well absolutely. and brandon you had also how many actors involved that could also put it out there i mean like you have a crew basically of people who are involved in the project well that i mean but then again that is why that their campaign is so because like like with garfield's crossing like the one that we did for we had god what like 10 act at least 10 actors mm -hmm. maybe 12 13 wow. i mean like yeah. more than a dozen so you've got like a dozen actors you've got five or six writers yeah and like with all of that posting every day on social media, we've got everybody getting out of the word. We still couldn't mm -hmm. make the goal. Granted, we needed a lot of money because we're trying to pay a bunch of actors for doing 16 one hour audio drama episodes. Mm -hmm. So, True. I mean, that's I mean, a one that was like a really big ass. But two was like, even with all of that, like it's still just we just couldn't get it across the finish line. True. So, but like, I, I have like we... mad respect for anyone who can actually do it. We, we figured out, I remember doing the math and being like, okay, well, if everyone is able to come up with a thousand dollars from their people, then we get there. And like it, once you break it down like that, it's like, that doesn't seem like that much to get from, you know, all the people I know, my family, like I was going to my family and being like, Hey, I do voiceover. If you have a business, if you want me to create something, if, you know, if you want me to do your your web, uh, your uh, voicemail for your business, I will do it. Or I'll call mm. someone and sing them happy birthday or whatever you want me to do. I will do this if you donate $100 to this campaign. Oh, so yeah. I yeah. was getting creative, but yeah. I mean, I was offering every oh, yes. shy of sexual again. favors, but I mean, it was an <laughs> <laughs> There's been a couple campaigns. Uh, well, the, the last campaign for sure, we were like sweating bullets like, oh God, are we actually going to make it? <laughs> Like so that so. was the animate one for the uh, the animated short, right? Yeah, that was yeah. our biggest Kickstarter. Yeah, that I was I was really happy to see that come through because that was I mean the minute I read this thing I was like man I would love to actually see this Aww. like in animation because it, it immediately just kind of had it has it, it creates like a very strong vibe which is like any good IP but I was like yeah this would look you know if done correctly this would look amazing and the short came out very well you know credit to oh, all thank of you. you. So, I mean, again, it's, um, you've got like, so tell us about like building that world. I like, how much of it did you come up with before you even set down the first page or was there some of it or was there, you know, maybe you get it like 60% of the way there and the rest of it comes like as you're going. Yeah. I think I would say that probably the, we probably had about 70% of it kind of, you know, at least roughly sketched out before we really even started doing the, the, the comic or, or the, the animation pitch. Um, uh, one of the things that we, we handed off to Michael Harper early on in, in the process where he was involved with the, um, the pitch creation process on that was like, I think a 40 page long world building document, just sort of 
Yeah, it wasn't even like like the the dreaded document where it's like here is the long history of of the world. It was more like, all right, here's what we think the tech is going to be. Here's what we think the factions are going to be, and just like all of that stuff. And to to our great benefit, Michael did not run away screaming at that point uh, because that <laughs> can sometimes kill kill a collaboration. Um, uh, but really an awful lot of the world has come into focus as we've gone through the story because we have this advantage that we are a weekly webcomic. Uh, we have this ability to each week as the story is moving forward, kind of have like this like little microcosm where we're shifting the, the lens over like this little new sliver of the world. And it allows us to, to fill in some of the details that otherwise um, a lot of other operations just wouldn't have the chance to do. So things like, you know, down to the minutia of like, like, a device that someone's using just just like little bits what it allows us to like insert like either a little snarky joke about this the state of the world or just like a little a little tidbit that's interesting and sometimes we get a chance to kind of loop back in on that and have a uh you have that really become important to the story and sometimes it's just sort of a, a fun thing to have um and it seems to be something that the audience responds really well to um it's to the point where we've we've included it in in the graphic novels where we've you know we've have a whole lore and world building section in the back, which is basically the collection of all these little snippets that we've put at the bottom of each webcomic page. Yeah, it's a very popular section. <laughs> yeah. I remember having to study that document before starting work on Kamikaze. <laughs> yeah, and it didn't scare Havana away, which is another important part of the process. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a huge thing with the world building, because I know when going into Garfield's Crossing, you know, you couldn't really approach just one story as a a tiny one piece of it, because you have to know what world it's in and all the other stories inform it. You know what I mean? So right. it's very, it's interesting to think about that. It's like, I think some people can get away with only knowing one story and other people, it's like, you kind of got to know it all, right? Yeah, right, and I can, right. And just like speaking from experience, it's one thing like for what we were trying to do with Garfield's Crossing, it was set in the modern day. It's setting in a small town, Georgia. So it's not like we're having to presuppose the next hundred years of history and global cataclysms and okay, what's going to be the fallout? How are people going to clump together? <laughs> the the sci-fi element like that, that definitely adds like if you want to make good sci-fi, I found like a lot of the best ones are the ones that have really thought out their stuff. And you can, and you kind of get a sense of it right up. And I feel like that's one of the things I was impressed with you guys. Like, even in just some of those opening things, like I, you, I thought you did a really good job of kind of building that world out where you can, it's almost like the, uh, the original star Wars approach where you just drop them in it and let people figure it out. But yes, but it's presented well enough where you can. Yeah. Um, that was one thing that, that we always go back to when it comes back to the script, like show don't tell. Right. And, um, but also like just making sure we are showing it in a way where the audience gets enough context to really understand like the environment and the dynamics of the world. Uh, and that, that can be very tricky sometimes, uh, especially with a short where we're like, this could be people's, most people's first time engaging with the world of Kamikaze. We need to like set these things up so that we um, give an accurate picture of like the premise in the world because um, it's it's going to be most people's first introduction to it. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, um, that was a really I'm interesting sure. writing challenge. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, and also one thing, like I know like with you guys, I mean, like nowadays uh, diversity is the big buzzword in Hollywood and there's people, there's obviously examples of people doing it right. And then other people you're doing it where it feels like it's a marketing thing. But you guys were like, I would say probably a good, like five to 10 years ahead of that conversation with just with this cast. And it, I mean, was that something that just happened organically or was it just kind of like, okay, we want to do, is it like, I'm sure there's a bit of a discussion that you had to be knowing of it, but is that kind right. of a more like how to t tell me how that kind of comes about? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, it, it feels like it was something where we, we always knew that, you know, because the world is diverse, we, you know, because the world has so many people and because this is sort of this, you know, again, 200 years in the future kind of situation where, you know, what's left of humanity is kind of clumped together in these places. Like, why would you even 
try to create this as sort of like a monoculture kind of thing? Why would you even try to just pretend that this is only going to be, you know, you know, like a white guy's story or anything like that? Like it's, you know, it was something where we definitely went into it with like, all right, we know that sci-fi and adventure stories are for everyone. Let's make sure that we are going into that very aware of the fact that we want to make sure that everyone feels welcome in it. And, you know, that does require holding ourselves up to um, more than just sort of a marketing slogan side of things. Like, you know, really trying to dig in deep and make sure that we're, when we do represent folks that aren't, you know, folks that look like us, um, that we're doing it right. And that's, that sometimes really means, you know, shutting up, sitting down and really listening often to like, all right, what, what have we done wrong here and how can we fix it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I am actually a huge proponent of that sort of stuff. Uh, to, sometimes to the detriment, <laughs> there have been points where we've had story lines that like I'm sitting there going, ah, oh, something's off with this guys. I don't know how we're going to handle this. And, you know, Alan and Havana are just sort of sitting there, ah, don't worry about it. It's fine, blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, and, you know, sometimes they are actually very much right, and I am absolutely overthinking it. But then other times I have been correct, and we've had to swerve wildly um, to, to just make sure that we're, we're doing our due diligence and making sure that we're doing this correct. Because one of the things we have to be very, uh, not, not knowledgeable of, but aware of, um, is that while Alan and I are white and Havana is Asian, like we are still sort of in that place of privilege. So coming to somebody in that place of privilege with a criticism is always a dangerous thing for a lot of people of color to do. Um, and so we, I, one of the things I'm really not, um, oh, what is the word? Um, I have to be very conscious of um, or that we have to be very conscious of is that, you know, while we are definitely here for everybody's, uh, uh, you know, compliments and stuff like that, we also pay very close attention to the criticism, um, Mm. especially when it's coming from from voices that, you know, like it's one thing to have somebody say, your stuff sucks. Um, and it's sort of like, okay, well, I would love to hear more about why it sucks. But when I hear like, it's coming from Joe Blow, you know, who is also, you know, part of the, uh, you know, the worst of the fascist organizations, then I have to kind of say, okay, I don't think you're really coming at this from a, a, a basis that isn't biased. Um, maybe we're doing a good job after all. Maybe we're doing a great job after all. <laughs> but at the same time, like when somebody comes to me and, and they ha- or shows up and they say hey i have this issue Mm -hmm. and not only are they nuanced about it but they're incredibly well you know doing a great job explaining why and sometimes it takes some some like coaxing talking and and conversation and coaxing because like absolutely i get it like some people Mm -hmm. are just like oh you're just trying to get a gotcha out of me and i'm like legit no i can't get better if i'm not called on my bs so yeah, I think that also we've uh, over the past, you know, 10 years, we've also culminated and nurtured um, a great team in our corner, right? Yes. Like we work with co-creators who are people of color. Um, we have, um, you know, authenticity readers. We have people editing. And these are people who are not only from, you know, various marginalized backgrounds, but they're well versed in, you know, representation, media, literature, Um, you know, you can't just pluck someone like, oh, you're an Asian here. (laughs) Like, tell me what you think. (laughs) Uh, They do need to have some sort of media literacy, especially in, um, you know, in within the issues of uh, representation. But also, uh, we love to keep around people who are not afraid to tell us feedback, like bluntly, straightforward, um, I mean, it's never from a place of cruelty or anything, but just like being constructive. And um, I yeah. think that's helped us uh, a lot. I mean, I know I've learned yeah. a lot over the past several years working on yeah. Kamikaze. Yeah. I mean, and and really... actually, uh, go, ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to point out uh, to, to that, that effect, like two, two really 
fantastic things have, have come out of that, just, just from on the book side of things. Um, one is Short Circuits, which is a uh, lovely anthology. And most of that's by um, creators of color. And that's basically, it's set in com- the same world as Kamikaze, but it's basically short adventures by a whole bunch of uh, indie creators. And it was really great to have them, you know, basically, you know, take, take the, the lead and let them just see where, where they went with the project. Uh, and another great thing is, um, it, well, it was a, a real pain in the ass while we had to do it. Um, uh, book three, the one we just published, uh, it's conclusion, basically a lot of how it resolves itself, uh, had to be rewritten by us. Not, not quite on the fly, but we had to basically go back to the drawing board on part of it because we, you know, Carrie had one of these like, no, this isn't quite sitting right. And ran it by one of our, our, you know, very straight talking, um, uh, sensitivity editors and, and readers. And she's like, yeah, no, that's absolutely a problem. And you, you guys should re- I really recommend you guys think on, on how you could do that better. And it, it was, it was, it was the, it was the kick in the pants we needed to, to, really think about it and say, all right, what are we actually trying to accomplish with, with this conflict with the scene and how can we do better without it running into the, the real problems that we're seeing right now? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the other thing is like, um, I, I read this uh, from the, I think the showrunner or the director of the Watchmen HBO series. Um, I mean, that series is wild, right? What a like radical idea, um, very novel and amazing. Like, and one of the things he um, said when he was casting like people to collaborate on that is he would pitch the idea and he would like, there were some people like, yeah, that's the most amazing idea ever. I'm in for it. There are some people who are like, oh, do not do that. That is a terrible idea. And then there were people in the middle like, okay, this is interesting, but I have some thoughts. And he said that he wanted those people in the middle category to come and work with him like because he wanted someone who could see the potential but also not just be a yes man right um and i i love that story and it's something that we keep in mind uh when uh, we're working on kamikaze and you know what and i think another thing um especially about uh, you know being a creator who's putting out characters that are not of your own background there's always no matter how solid you make everything there's always going to be skepticism from new readers there's always going to be skepticism from people who are walking by your booth table and you just have to accept that and just kind of like just roll with it and and just move on and uh, hope that you know you earn their trust and readership right um that's another aspect of the puzzle because i I think sometimes people like oh so should i just write characters who are my background like no, that's absolutely not what we're saying. Um, but just just know that there is skepticism for good reason, because it's been done very poorly before. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's there's uh, many many years of uh, Hollywood history and probably no no shortage of comic stuff as well where you can see where 100%. it wasn't done right. And that's one of the things mm-hmm. I always admire. You guys have, I've I've you know having been following you, I've noticed like I I've admired your humility and kind of genuinely wanting to reach out and say hey how can we do this better and kind of do it yeah. in a way that, that, that it's, that's genuine and then it will be reflected in the work exactly mm-hmm. thank you <laughs> yeah so i um i it's interesting to hear all this because i don't obviously brandon knows your work <laughs> i just was introduced to it um i just want to pivot a little bit and ask you because you kind of talked about before in your backgrounds that Carrie, you're doing this full time. Alan, I can't quite remember what you said on the side if you did mention it. And Havana, you have a full time job. So I'd love to hear from you all. You know, how do you, when you take on something like this and you did say, oh, if we'd known from the start, maybe we wouldn't have done this if we'd, if we'd known what we were getting into, right? So when things get hard, how do you claw out that space for your own personal creativity? Are there times when that is too overwhelming? Are there times when it gives you energy or, or how does that work in your life? Havana, you want to take a lead on this concerning you've got a, a panel yeah. all about this? Yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, I, I am in a more fortunate situation because, you know, I do have two really great collaborators 
having partners on a creative project like this makes such a difference. I don't know if I could have gone this long on Kamikaze if it was just myself. Now, there are other creators who do work solo and, you know, it's not impossible. But um, when things get hard, it like one of the things we've had to learn, and it's a lesson we learn over and over again, is that communication is so key. Like, and just being not just honest with your partners, but honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, over the past 10 years, of course, like all of us have gone through family issues, mental health issues, financial issues, whatever. But whatever it is, we're like, we try to be proactive about like, hey, heads up team, I've got, you know, it's really hard for me to focus on this stuff right now. Can I just like do the bare minimum? What does that bare minimum look like? How long will it be for? Like, I think we do a good job checking in with each other. Yeah. It was better before the pandemic, <laughs> I will admit, <laughs> but uh, we still have a Slack channel that we update every day. Um, one of the things that was very helpful, uh, the one of the things I always tell people is to have like a scheduled check-in time or day. It could be um, in the tech world, we call them stand-ups where it's just maybe a 15 minute call where we all just update each other on what we're working on, what we're going to focus on and move on if we have any blockers. One of the things I, I really enjoyed that we started doing it during the pandemic is um, we have a channel in our Slack uh, called uh, Spoons. So like the whole concept is like, do you have enough spoons today to like handle the stuff or, you know, work on the project? Um, basically your mental health capacity. And that was actually really helpful because during the pandemic, it was up and down like every day, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so just finding ways to communicate and just be open with your, um, with your co-creators for sure. Right. Yeah. And we have another, another, um, another channel there called Squirrel Cage, which is like, like squirrel, <laughs> squirrel brain thoughts, which is sort of like, if you have like, just like an anxious thought, it's like, you're like, you don't want the, the rest of the team to like act seriously on like your, your panic attack on something, mm -hmm. but you just need to like <laughs> vent the fact that you're like, you're, you're, you're like freaked out about sales or how we're going to do conventions yeah. or you know, anything just like, it's there as a sort of like that. Okay. This is a place where you can, you can dump it. You can let everyone know what's on your mind. But it's also sort of like this this understood thing. It's like you're not expecting someone to jump in with a solution right now. Yeah. I right. Like or like it was just a nice space to have just to air out any concerns. Because one of the things I I think we fell into the trap of is we would have a concern, but then we would gaslight ourselves and just tell ourselves, <laughs> oh, it's probably nothing. They're, I don't want to bother them with this. And that always bit us in the ass. <laughs> whenever we had something like that it's like no you just you should have just said it <laughs> so it's a, it is nice to have a space where like okay i'm really freaked out do we have a table at this convention or not <laughs> <laughs> yeah i like that you've compartmentalized these things for yourselves <laughs> so that people know how to because then you don't have to preface it each time and say hey guys exactly. i just i just need to get this off my chest it's like no this is the anxiety corner and this is the actual <laughs> like work corner and this is the other one yeah, exactly that's great <laughs> right yep yeah I, I think for for a, a three-person team we probably have like well over the average number of slack channels like i think about 20 or something channels just like and over in this box we've got <laughs> and well, sometimes honestly, it's a little we, hard to get yeah, yeah we use them all pretty i mean i don't think we really have any that are just like completely abandoned we, that we never use you know yeah um yeah but yeah i like how our slack is set up actually <laughs> <laughs> It, it's like the old clubhouse, like everything's in its place. Like it's like yeah. that corner. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to touch that quarter eventually. Like, yeah, it, it needs a but little it, bit of dusting, but it like evolved over time, you know, is because right. like, you know, in our general chat, one of us would be freaking out and having a panic attack over something like really minute. And the other two of us would be like, hmm, we would have like side conversation, like, okay, why, why are they freaked out about this? <laughs> <laughs> so it was nice to just evolve, uh, you know, our communications to accommodate that. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, like, I, I think, you know, I, I believe in open communication, but to do that, you have to make the space for yeah. that type of communication. And also just like uh, sort of talking on like the sort of squirrel cage one, it's 
I can't tell you how many times I've had to go in there and say, hey, so I have this thing that I'm really worried about. And I, I know that this might be like not an issue. And then Havana and Alan are like, actually, no, that's a huge issue. Please tell us more. Or they might come to me and say, you know what? There, there's like, it's like a team sort of lift up where your concerns are valid, but here's the reasons why we don't think that's going to be a problem. And here's what mm-hmm. we can do to prevent it becoming a problem. And then like, not only is it a great way for communication, but it's also just a great way to like build camaraderie and trust within your team because yeah. now you know, okay, I can come with the, to them with a problem and they're not going to laugh me off the face of the earth. Mm-hmm. Yep. So. Yeah, I've definitely yeah. learned over this last just uh, last <laughs> few years of like doing collaborative projects and you know podcasts and the other like that that workflow and kind of managing I guess I guess it's like tending to the work relationship. You know that yes. is that is a very kind of understated part of the business. One of the things they don't tell people don't you really tell you when you're getting into it. I mean, I feel like nowadays it's become much more of a thing because people are looking at like work life balance and what is the culture of this, that, and the other place. But like, so you guys seem to have kind of come to it like in a nice kind of organic fashion and it seems to be working for you. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. that's, yeah. Uh, that's, that's very impressive. And believe me, I, I having watched it go wrong from the other end, <laughs> I, I, uh, I tip my hat to you for uh, figuring, getting that figured out. Yeah, I've yeah. I've also been part of many a dysfunctional team. So <laughs> I'm very happy with the team behind Kamikaze. <laughs> Uh, I I, uh, I genuinely res- genuinely respect these two ladies sticking around long enough for us to solve <laughs> some of the big problems on that front, <laughs> and uh, uh, we're still still at it, which is uh, it still blows my mind that you know when I, I tell people like when we're doing the table pitch, you know that we've been doing this since you know 2015. You know, I've been doing the comics mm-hmm. since 2015. You know, like my brain goes really 2015? That was eight years ago. Two You're still doing this after eight years. <laughs> <laughs> Two administrations ago. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just got back from Washington no. D.C. Oh no, that's what I was gonna say. I was just thinking, you know, thankfully it's two administrations. We're not still on the yeah. you know, the last one. Yeah, God. yeah. That's true. There is that. There is that very broad silver line. <laughs> you yeah. can put off the apocalypse for just a little bit longer. Just a little bit. Yeah. 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 At least until 2024. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. So, like, uh, what's uh, are there? So, is there anything? Uh, what's what's next? Are you are you guys at liberty to say at this moment? So, um, I, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so, we just published the third book, and in in the the grand tradition of the Kamikaze series, it is not the end of the story by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, in the grand tradition of the graphic novels it is a part one of two <laughs> so book four should be coming relatively soon uh it's probably too early for me to say when it'll be showing up because we're still you know mailing out volume threes to everyone uh that volume four will probably be a kickstarter because we tried to do uh volume three uh without a kickstarter and we really missed out on the marketing uh, side of it so i, th- I think we as much work and as much stress as the Kickstarters can be, I think we will be going back to to Kickstarter for Volume Four. Um, watch this space, every other space for <laughs> news on that. Um, and something else that we're, we're kind of exploring uh, very early in the exploration of, we don't know how far we'll get into this, uh, uh, is that because my, my background, you know, before getting into the comics and animation side of it was uh, the, the game development side of things. Uh, I've always kind of had an itch in the back of my head about trying to develop Kamikaze into something in a computer or, or video game space. And this year we started taking that a little bit more seriously. Uh, I went to the Game Developers Conference uh, in San Francisco earlier this year and was kind of showing around some early ideas and got some some pretty some pretty encouraging early interest. We, we don't have anything really big to announce on that front, but it's, it's an exciting thing to play around with. And we're hoping that we'll be able to have something more to talk about soon on that front. Cool. Yeah. It was well, really exciting seeing uh, the type of reception Alan was getting over at GDC. Uh, 
Yeah, we weren't expecting like such a welcoming and encouraging uh, reception there. But yeah, there's some exciting conversations that came out of that. Alan did like 30 pitch meetings in what, three days? Whoa. Yeah, it was, it was something like that. And it was I made something mistake, insane. Yeah. yeah. I, I made the mistake of, of mentioning that to a couple of the other, uh, you know, like the publishers and stuff. And they're like, like yeah, you know, we, we feel you. Yeah, we've got 58 this week and uh, oh. we're, we're hoping we'll be able to sleep. And I was like, okay, I, I feel bad for, for making it sound you like that. You I was the one carrying the heavy cross here. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> It's hard though when you're not used to something. I feel like you know maybe right. maybe they've yeah. more experience and they've been there before. And yeah, you know, I always kind of you know pe- tell people like you know I might do you know fifty auditions in a day, and they're like, oh my god, I can't even do five. And it's like you can work up to that. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you, know, you gotta yeah. you gotta build those muscles. <laughs> Yeah, those are rookie numbers. You got to get those numbers up. <laughs> I don't want to make anyone feel bad. I'm just saying, like, right. you know, like it, the, you know, that's why I feel like, you know, them being like, oh, that, da, 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 you know, it's like you, you haven't done it before. Of course, it's going to be. Everybody's got to start somewhere, thing. man. Right. Yeah. Right. And also, I, I think it also circles back to the delusional optimism thing we were <laughs> talking about. Because I think, like, one thing about, new ideas whenever we all discuss like the possibility of doing a new idea the animated short um venturing into games etc we we have like weeks long debates and discussions on it um and of course the game thing was another thing that on paper it's like there's a million reasons why not to do it but then you know just kind of having to go back to our roots and like, you know, the delusional optimism that helped us get where we are today. I'm like, you know what? Why not just try? Why not just go to GDC and just pitch it? And if it doesn't work out, cool. We're at the same place we're at now. Um, But I'm really glad that Alan went ahead and uh, just kind of went for it. So. Yeah. So yeah, one there's thing, there's definitely some. Go ahead, go ahead, Brandon. No, no, no. I was to say no. One thing that we've that's uh, we've we've already done a couple of interviews at this point, and it definitely seems to be becoming a theme that the "why not me" mentality seems to you know mm-hmm. put a, gives you a lot of fuel in the tank for these uh, for your whatever creative endeavor you're on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, think, you just gotta try stuff. Yeah. No. I, I think there's. There, there, any creative project which you know makes it past, let's call it the 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 back of the napkin phase. Like I think you do need to kind of adopt a little bit of that. Like, well, I'm not seeing anyone else do this, so I might as well just assume that it's it's just up to me to get this this pulled together. Or you know, in the case of mm-hmm. our, our our merry band, you know, just the three of us to 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 move this forward, and. Mm-hmm. That can get you pretty far, <laughs> especially if you have a couple of nice folks show up in the comments um, mm-hmm. to, to egg you on. Yeah. yeah. So I was I, like I trying wanna, to explain. I to play off that. No, no, go, go ahead, Billy. Go ahead. Oh, I wanted to play off that and ask because um, the last interview we did with was a friend of mine named Eric Robinson, and he had mentioned something along the lines of that, uh, you know, he and I both have never really worked in the whole nine to five type of thing. And he was like, for him, that was the absolute, that would be the absolute worst. So, you know, for you guys, is it the, is it the, oh my gosh, well, if we push ourselves, we can do this amazing thing that we want that's ours. And what is the alternative to that? Is, was there ever ever any sense of that um, going into this project of, we, we got to make this work because the alternative is not what we really want in life or I'm just curious. I, I think that's definitely been the, the case with, with Karen and myself. Like I, I was, I was before I really went full-time on Kamikaze and it has become sort of a full-time thing for me mm-hmm. outside of a couple of contract jobs here and there. Um, like it, it really has become sort of the full-time gig. Um, I, I would say that, for Carrie and I, like it, it definitely was like, a, let's let's focus on this because the alternative is that we're we're going to feel like we're we're constantly trying to run up a very slippery hill to try to get noticed, um, and, and it kind of accepted into the the the, the big 
corporate art machine, which is, you know, the animation world, which is, mm. there's a lot that's, that works well in it. And there's a lot of stuff which really does grind down a lot of, of, you know, creative folks, mm -hmm. um, to where they are, you know, they might be doing nine to five, but it's also nine to five on Saturdays. It's nine to five, you know, you know, when they're supposed to be with, you know, their families and it, there, there's always sort of like the carrot held at the, at the very end of the track. They're like, maybe if you get far enough, far enough into the system, you'll be able to become like a director or something. And then maybe you'll be able to pitch something to the networks that way. And sort of like, like, let's just, let's try doing it the hard way first. Let's, let's see if we can, um, you know, try doing it outside the system, maybe a little bit punk rock and find out exactly why we're not supposed to do it this way first. Um, yeah. because I, I, we've, de we've definitely done the nine to five thing. And I, I know for me, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who gets very easily distracted by like a, 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 an idea or a concept. And I really need to like spend like five, 10 minutes, just like scribbling it down, just so it's out of the, out of the brain and on some other medium. And that isn't always conducive, you know, in like a professional art environment or art environment where it's like, all right. We need you to get these 50 th things done today. Um, really counting on you getting them done. And you can do both. It's just, it, it's a hard thing to navigate. So I think for me, at least personally, being able to really shift into having this be the, f the, the priority was a, a big, a big preferential thing. Yeah. For me, a lot of it was just, I was running into problems where again, during the recession, it just sort of felt like, the, the phrase I would always get was that you're talented, you obviously have skills, but you're a nice to have. Um, yeah. And so I wasn't an essential. I was always this nice to have. And it was sort of like, so after a while, it just sort of felt like no one was taking me seriously. And part of me, like for a while, was like, okay, what am I doing wrong? Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm the problem. So I started working on my portfolio and trying to get my stuff put together. I'm so sorry, y'all. Um, I have a dog and she, I think there's a bird in the yard. Um, sorry. But anyway, there was like a nine to five um, sort of mentality that, you know, you weren't working on what you wanted to be. And I am so sorry. It's Let okay. me. Uh... Kira. Uh, I... <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Go it's ahead. Right. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, interviewing in the modern age. Uh, oh, yeah. So, um, Carrie, so it sounds like you were, were just frustrated by the whole, like, it, trying to struggle with the nine to five and then still having things that you really wanted for yourself. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah, but then at the same time, it was also, like, the nine to five space as well. Like, you were, there was the frustration of, you were working on somebody else's idea and you could see the problems before they ever came forward. And it was sort of like, okay, I understand you're working on X and you want Y to happen, but you can't get to Y without doing the next thing that, you know, involves Z, D and E. And it's sort of like the sort of mental math that they were doing. Like I've always been a storyteller I got my first writing award when I was in the third grade for an absolutely abysmal thing. It was a giant mistake. I'm sure it was, but um, like, it was um, like a story has always made me like, I'm very interested in story. I have a lot, really good understanding of it. And so to have somebody, you know, sort of say, well, your opinion doesn't matter. And the whole idea of like your own, ability to provide feedback in a way that you know okay i i i do this like part of the reason i'm i'm in this is because i do this it's sort of like it doesn't matter that i've been writing since i was in the third grade it doesn't matter that by the time i was in middle school i had written over 315 pages in a single summer it didn't matter that i had done all this work and studied all this story because i had no background to prove it other than I had all these files. The only thing that mattered was I was, I was sort of this, this peasant that was supposed to stay in the place 
and push the plow. And I was saying, hey, the plow would be better if you did X, Y, or Z. Or the field would grow better if you did X, Y, and Z. The plow would go um, a lot faster if you hook some donkeys up to it. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not to sit there and say that, oh, I'm so much better. It's just like simple things like, you know, maybe don't hit on the people that are working for you. Or like maybe don't come up to one of your animators and say she has to walk around like a dog to know what it feels like to be a dog because we're working on a dog project. A director actually did that to me. He wanted me to get down on all fours in front of him to walk around like a dog. It's that's yeah. awkward. <laughs> I feel like that's the, the artistic equivalent of what is it, the Dunning-Kruger effect. You got a lot of these people out there, I think, because they can, they can bulldog their way into those spaces. Not, yeah. You know, with, with the most minimal knowledge. Meanwhile, you've got, like, the people who actually know things, like yourself, who are just kind of in there, kind of like, you know, you buy into that thing. Well, if I just work hard. Yeah, exactly. And, and it felt like a scam. That yeah, it, it very, I mean, it very much is, I feel, because it's like you look at a lot of those people that really get up there and kind of, I mean, my God, you see, like, with so many crappy movies and TV show, you say, like, well, you, you, you have to kind of wonder, like, well, does somebody, you know, this, this is probably not somebody who did the work and just got ahead. Like, in some cases, yeah, but in other times, it's like, this is somebody who probably knew someone and then they got their they got in there and because and then they start making them you know the political moves they've got to make and they get up there and it's kind of like you know like the the uh i don't know house of cards or whatever you say like you know that foundation isn't as solid as someone like yourself who's written three thousand pages who's been writing since they were in the third grade winning awards no less i mean and it's but it's like that's i think that's the thing that i think people it's one thing it's, it's evident in the work, but it's also like, I think people, when people look at like the creative, like industry from the outside, they don't always realize that. Um, or like, are they, or they think it's all, you know, they don't know how to kind of accurately gauge it. You kind of see someone's like, well, how did that get made? Whereas then you see something else come out of the blue. It's like, Oh, well that's, you know, that's, that's really good stuff. And, mm -hmm. and it, it, I think it's, um, it's, it speaks to this kind of thing that I've noticed, and maybe you guys have seen it probably more being out there in this this world, like where the people, I mean, it's it's something to be said for having that knowledge base and kind of like earning your, I don't know what you say, like, you know, you've kind of, you've kind of been put through your paces, you've kind of, you again, you've done the work, but then there's a lot of stuff out there where like you see like bad writing where it feels like people are just pulling something out of their rear. Yeah. Just because they want that spectacle or like the, you know, like uh, a writing teacher of mine used to say like, you know, you get the moment, but did you earn it? Yes. Right. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think an awful lot of, at least the stuff that ends up on like uh, mainstream channels, uh, a lot of it ends up, you know, just sort of, sort of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, there's sort of, also sort of like the C-suite effect where you'll have like, you know, an executive who got there through, you know, being good at business school and making the right connections through business school. And they, they land their, their position at a, at a creative media company and like, well, I, I've got to prove my, my, my chops that I, I know what to do on the creative media side. So, you know, th this is, you know, in order to feel like I'm doing something, here's, here's the, either the feedback I'm going to give to a, a very early stage project, which I don't really understand it, but I need to feel like I'm, I'm making feedback so that I feel like I'm, I'm doing my job or, you know, they'll, they'll commission something sort of from like a, well, I, I think Westerns are back in or something along those lines. <laughs> and you'll have, you'll have folks, you know, sometimes at sort of, you know, where Carrie was in, in, in her journey when we first started doing this, or sometimes even more like seasoned teams who are like, oh, like a, this is, this is a terrible idea, but I really need to, to, you know, to put <laughs> bread on the table this month. Um, and yeah, I, I always feel really conflicted about like some of the, the, the projects which really come out, which are really marginal because it's on, on one hand, it's like, this is a really disappointing end product. But at the same time, I know that a lot of the folks who are involved in this, you know, were really trying to do their best to make it, <laughs> to try to salvage it along the way. Yeah. Um, and I feel really, really lucky that with, with our th three person team, we've been able to at least shorten the timeline between terrible idea and salvaged comic page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I guess that, that, that is another thing to sort of think about at the end of the day, when you're working a nine to five, especially in the creative industry, at the end of the day, what is going to happen if you get that coveted spot, if you get the ability to pitch to somebody, 
if you get the ability to to have your pitch greenlit, you don't own that property. That idea that you created is not yours. That world you created is not yours. It's like take, have it's like doing all the work to have a baby and then giving it away to somebody else. And then giving it away to somebody else who then takes it to a plastic surgeon and completely changes it. Right. Oh yeah. Pretty much. It's, it, it, it's so and and that alone was just like not sitting well with sort of my internal sense of justice in the way of like is this the real world? Yes. But I if I can manage to to live in a world or create a world where I can, you know, I take jobs on the side, I do client work, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm not doing this. I would say kamikaze is my full-time job, but I have a part-time job doing client work. And it's like, I still make ends meet, but I'm doing this to make sure that at the end of the day, kamikaze and the world that we've created are still part of, you know, our our repertoire these characters are our kids this project i mean as havana was saying like this is our baby and i i the idea of sort of putting it in a box and selling it just um in a way that you know where the ownership and we don't have ideas of like how to how to continue the story just seems very strange to me um it's Especially for something that we've been working art. on so long. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's the double-edged sword of art, right? Like on one yeah. hand, like you, you know, you raise up the baby and you get it, you know, you build this, you, you create this work and it's, it's becomes precious to you. But in order to, to make those, make that money and get yourself known and build it and do all the stuff you need to do to keep making the art, you've got to put it out there to people who may not necessarily understand it or appreciate it and just see it as like some commodity. Yeah. And that's right. it. And it's like uh, the only time where you actually have the point or the, the place to put something out there that is your own uh, with you as sort of like the creative lead or having some sort of creative input at all, you have to have created it yourself, built the brand yourself, built everything yourself before they'll even look at it. And only then they'll be like, yeah, I guess you can executive produce or, you know, assistant executive like type of stuff. And at least then you have a say, you know, like I keep thinking about um, Michael DiMartino and Brian Konetsko with uh, Avatar The Last Airbender and how that worked for them. And like Nickelodeon has screwed them over so many times on something that is just obviously precious to them. And then to have Netflix pick them up and they're like, phew, okay, we're okay. We can do this again and have Netflix come in and say, eh, no, we're not going to do that either. They gave them the promise of saying, yeah, we're going to give you full creative control. You're going to have all this sort of stuff. And then Netflix comes in as like, so we're trying, we're thinking about making this like a, a sort of twilight romance, you know, triangle thing. And them just sort of saying, you've completely missed the point. <laughs> like, it's, it's wild. And the entire system is so fickle. Um, And after a while, you just have to sort of say, okay, do I want to continue within this path or do I not? And the only way you can really do that is if you own the property. I think about when you say that Michaela Cole, and do you Mm. know who I'm talking about? I don't think so. She wrote, I will destroy you. And she was um, chewing gum. So she was leading chewing gum and then she wrote, I will destroy you, which was about her own experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, when she went to go try to sell it, they wanted control and they were going to give her money and whatever. And she said, no, I want creative control. And she ended up holding out and got it. And she got a lot of money, but she also got control, Mm -hmm. which is the whole thing is. Oh, good. Because it seems interesting to me that you would, you know, like you said, you, you have to have a certain amount of creative interest, um, meaning you're doing interesting things in order to get noticed in the first place. But then Mm -hmm. they pump that into the little, you know, Play-Doh machine and squeeze it all up and then squish it out the other side. And it's like, not at all what it was. And, you know, I've seen so many things where it's like, this is a really great thing. Hey, let's put it through this little processor and it comes at the other end and you're like, 
what happened? That is mm-hmm. not recognizable yeah. in any way, shape, or form, Aragon. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I know it's an old reference, but seriously. That's Shots fired. Still I mean, she's not that, wrong. They're not wrong. It's still one of the movies that I'm, like, so disappointed in because the book was so good. And then the movie was like, what? Huh? What? Um, <laughs> it's sort of like I, watching Western people try, or Western studios try to create recreate anime titles. And it's just like, you got this so bad. So, mm. did you even watch the source material? Like, <laughs> I keep thinking about that Dragon Ball Z version that they did. It was just like, wow. Oh, goodness. I, I, Cowboy I would... Bebop. Yep. Oh, oh, oh. It just, just hurt me, Hannah. You hurt my. Hurt... Why did you bring that they, up? I feel triggered. They did Vicious and Julia so dirty. <laughs> God, that that I was I was so excited when I first saw it, even though I was thinking, you know, John Cho would have been great in this 20 years ago. Not that he didn't look amazing mm-hmm. in that role, but I just kept thinking, yeah, good God, like that just it, uh, man, I don't. That's yeah. Two things we you don't all... want to discuss. Yeah, that's one of those things oh. like I, we just shouldn't go there because it's going to this 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 whole episode is just going <laughs> to take a, a wild turn yeah was this the live action is it live action yeah yes. oh okay i saw the old movie. yeah the one on netflix what? it is uh i got like literally i think about 15 minutes into the first episode and had to turn it off and i think i barely made it through i think i got through i forced myself to kind of watch the first two and it just got to be too painful it just i yeah. was very forgiving of it at first like very <laughs> open-minded but that they just like I, it goes back to what you were saying billy like they're was a reason why the original thing was so popular. But when you change it so much in a remake or so much through this process that you're talking about, it's like, what? why? Why would you change something that was that worked really well in the original? <laughs> I don't understand the rationale. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> you see it You see it a lot. It's so much like you see it in Hollywood. There's the, uh, uh, if, if anyone, is it, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with uh, Kevin Smith's whole like Superman story. Mm-hmm. back in the day oh, oh yeah. i have uh, like heard about that yeah so like if for for the uninitiated if this we can put a link to this clip up kevin smith at one point many many years ago was contracted to write a superman movie and one of his uh the one of the producers the guy who's still attached to it to this day somehow he is like his name is on superman and he was wanting to do like a superman movie where it's like i don't want him to fly what? And I want to cast, yeah. And he's like, and I want to cast Sean Penn because that guy is a stone cold killer. And it, and that's what? not even the craziest part. Like the story, just like how what this producer wanted to do is so like antithetical to Superman that you're oh just like, gosh. how did this guy get this property? And I feel like I've seen like there's been multiple times where I've seen like you see something like on comic books, like when you go like why did like you don't seem like you or you see like people who are given like franchise or like something that was a, a previous ip like a comic or a book or something it's like why did you get this because it doesn't seem like you actually like it yeah yeah and that happens a lot like the halo series that was on um i don't know if it was apple or oh, something paramount. like paramount. paramount like all the people were not halo fans and then um from what i know like he takes off the the helmet very early on as like Whoa! Right. <laughs> and then it's like very anticlimactic how he does. Like, it's just like, do, do you guys even know anything about the source material? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it boggles my mind. Yeah, it just it, it 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 amazes me that that that's so. It seems to be like way too prevalent. Like you see, like um, I, I I'm not not to get too off on it, but like just like the the old. I know DC is about to come into like a new era now because James Gunn's got a hold of it. And he seems like a guy who actually reads comic books, mm-hmm. but yes. you see some of the previous stuff and you're just like, dude, you don't like, why are you directing Superman? Cause it doesn't seem like you actually like yeah. Superman. Right. Exactly. Or it's you know, just like any of that. So it's like, kind of like, why, how does this keep happening? Like it's the, uh, it just, Again, I guess it's like Billy was describing. It's just like they see it like Play-Doh. I can just grab it and mold it into whatever I want. And because I, I would, I, I criticized Lucasfilm on this back in the day when they first got a hold of Star Wars. Like they cranked out that sequel trilogy. And you could say, you guys clearly didn't have a plan for this. Like y'all were just like, okay, we're just going to slap a Star Wars label on it. We're all going to make a billion dollars. And yeah. then they got, you know, there's, I mean, yeah. granted, there's a certain element of the fandom that's just toxic as hell. 
but yeah, there's also totally. a lot of legit criticism, especially in the storytelling aspects of that. You can say, well, yeah, you guys, like, y'all didn't have a plan, and it's pretty damn obvious to anybody who's paying attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. But at the same time, when you're a creative, like, you always have to continue, like, working on those creative chops. And, like, one of the things that we do in house is that, you know, we, we create other IPs, other properties, things that we aren't as, you know, attached to. So not only do we keep our skills up and continue being as, you know, creative and, you know, uh, producing different ideas and IPs, but, you know, we also have the opportunity so that when there is a day where we can, you know, we have something that we're comfortable selling that we're comfortable giving away um so like being a it's not exactly a single road sort of system it's sort of like i don't know at this point with everything going on with the wgi strike and everything uh the director's talking about striking and then um you've also got sag talking about striking like so much of it is just I don't know if I can cuss on this show, but it's just a shit yeah, story. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, let it fly. Um, okay. But yeah, it, it's just wild. And um, I remember talking to Greg Wiseman. He's the guy who did um, Gargoyles, Gargoyles, Young Justice, all that kind of stuff. Amazing guy. Really cool. But the first time I met him, I was like, dang, this dude is jaded as I don't know what. And then I got further into the industry and I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. He's a ray of sunshine. <laughs> He's, he still believes. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely still believes because how else is any, any of that other stuff getting made? Like Young Justice came back. But, you know, his whole point is that, or not his whole point, but one of the things he said to me was like, Carrie, anything that gets made in this industry is an effing miracle. Just because you had you he was telling me that there was a point where he would pitch an idea a producer would love it they'd go talk to their team and they were like okay we want everybody to come here with a ceo blah 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 he would pitch it in the room to everybody else and then it all it took was one person saying eh, and then the entire room would shift so he went from something where he would absolutely have a hundred percent gotten it but because one person made the sort of eh noise or like had a question suddenly that project was immediately dust in his hands mm -hmm. and the it, the reason a lot of this is happening is because when you're working in hollywood all that kind of stuff um these producers executives their jobs are so tentative if they make a single wrong move even a simple mistake they are fired they're on the street and they have to go find another job. Um, and LA is not a cheap city to live in. So you can't be without work for only so long before you really are, you know, completely screwed. So and these executives have no room for making mistakes. They have no room for experimentation. Everything has to be an ex a success. And even things that are a mild success at this point, like let's say, okay, you made your money back. That's a success. No, that's not a success. That's now considered a failure. So it's like the measure of what is a success versus what is not is constantly moving. The goalpost is constantly changing and it's getting harder and harder and harder. Not because fans don't want to go see movies or people aren't interested in film anymore. It's because there's sort of like the, these internal ideas of what media should be and how it should work with people who are not passionate about it as a creative art form and only care about the money that it makes. And it has to be both. If you swing to one heart, uh, one, one side too far to the executive side and the money business side making, you're going to get the soulless stuff that we often see. If you swing to, too hard to the other side of like doing art and creativity, then you're going to have no money in order to make the next thing. So it has to be that balance. And it feels like we are constantly like swinging way too far to one side or way too far to another. And there's no real middle point. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have in this creative industry as a whole right now. I'll absolutely. get off my soap. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Everything you just said. Um, my boyfriend was in the film industry for a long time uh, doing background casting and 
he keeps up with a lot of it. And he talks about this all the time is that, you know, when, when, like you said, these suits, they're just suits, right? They don't know anything about the art side of it. They don't care about the art side of it. It's a publicly traded company. They have to make money quarter over quarter over quarter. So eventually it's like going like this and it's like, well, how are we going to keep making money like that? Which leads to things like HBO just shutting down production and saying, hey, we have this in the can, but we're not even going to release it. It's not going to see the light of day. So you've worked on this show that you put your heart into. It's it's gone. No one's ever going to see this. And that type of stuff keeps happening. And it's so like you said before, it all comes back to I own this or I don't own this. So. Yeah. Well, guys, at least, we have, at least we have. I'm sorry. We have all uh, we have gone over. I know we have uh, kept you well over an hour at this point. Um Thank you so much for coming out and uh, hanging with us for this time. Uh, tell the people where they can find you online or where they can find the project. Uh, and Sure. Um, yeah, you can uh, find out all about Kamikaze. You can find the, the webcomic, our online shop. You can find the uh, animated short uh, at kmkz.tv. Uh, and we are on Instagram as Kamikaze Animated. Uh, we are on Mastodon. Uh, kamikaze at comics town um we have a twitter where we're kind of moving away from elon's little circus uh but you can find us as kamikaze comic just in case a miracle happens and uh elon finally does go to space um uh, we, you, you can follow us there um and uh you can find me personally mostly on mastodon you can guess who led the charge there um at uh that topper kid at mastodon.art yeah and you can find me uh havana at uh, on instagram at havana underscore n um and of course uh alan's already shared all the kamikaze stuff at kamikazecomic.com and also, if, uh, I guess my personal site as well, uh, HavanaWin.com, for just art and the non-kamikaze stuff. <laughs> um, you guys can find me everywhere at Mermaid Shells. It looks like Mermaid's Hells, but it's Mermaid Shells. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty cool, too, though. Everywhere. Um, it's metal. Can- <laughs> uh so much mermaid murder uh, <laughs> yeah it's a uh mer murder mer murder i was thinking that metal song murder. anyway uh yeah you can find me there and um if you have any questions for any of us if you ever have you know a thought uh we read comics like they are you know comments like they are the precious puppies that they are we love our fans and anybody who actually has a um, opinion or wants art or you know wants to check out our YouTube page we also have uh, a lot of advice that you can find there too awesome guys uh, thanks again uh, Billy do you have any final thoughts um, no thank you so much it was so nice to meet all of you it's great likewise yeah thanks, likewise. thanks for would having us on to, would love to hear your thoughts on what you when you finally get the chance to read Billy cool thanks I will that will be all for this episode to keep up with the show follow us on facebook instagram and twitter at scratch claw push if social media isn't your thing you can contact us at scratch claw push at gmail.com this podcast has been a carcutta media production for a full list of our podcasts go to carcuttamedia.com slash podcasts this recording or any portion thereof may not be reproduced or used in any manner whatsoever without the express written permission of the publisher, except for use of brief quotations and review. Copyright 2023 by Carcutta Media, LLC. All rights reserved.